afternoon, everyone. It's supposed to be the last day on Earth by the Maya prediction, so we need to focus this afternoon. So it's a, it's a real pleasure for me to present uh, our speaker today. Uh, at, at several levels. First, because the topic is interesting to all of us, as you can see, it links what we appreciate as neuroscience with molecular experiments and computational uh, analysis. And second, because Daniela is one of us who grew up in this building, she performed a PhD in my lab, and then she moved for postdoctoral postdoctoral fellowship to Robert Sapolsky, a well-known expert of stress in Stanford. And from there, she was kidnapped to Berkeley, where she's uh, an associate professor in the Helen Wade uh, Center for Neuroscience where we have a lot of friends. And uh, this is the season for Israelis to come visit and give us standing now. So we are all looking forward to hearing what happened new in the can, can you guys hear? Is yeah. that better? Is that too much? I have to, um, to apologize. I'm, I'm getting over a cold, and my voice is absolutely scratchy. So I hope it's not too daunting. Um, it's really, really a pleasure, and thank you, Mona and Arlel, for, for inviting me. It, it's, um, it's actually my first time back, not visiting Israel, but it's my first time back to the Hebrew University and giving a talk since I left. Hi, Leon. And, so, and, and to be in a room with friends and so on, very, very exciting. So thank you. Um, I want to tell you today a little bit of what we do. Thanks. A little bit of what we do in the lab, and we do a lot of different things. So I'm going to focus on just one aspect of it. But just to give you a taste of what the lab does um, overall and generally is um, that if I have to put it all into one basket, I'll say that we're uh, working on the neurobiology of plasticity, and not so much by choice or design, but somehow by how we got carried away with the experiments, uh, we got to focus on the role of glia in neuroplasticity. We started very, I started extremely neurocentric, and, and each of the different projects kind of took us into what the role of glia in it would be. So that's sort of the overall umbrella of what we look at. Um, our projects kind of look across the lifespan. So we start with neonates, and we pay specific attention to adolescent uh, area of uh, the time of the rat and then to adults and look at plasticity and trajectories that are different in critical periods in those specific time points. Um, we ask questions about the environmental context and the environmental context would be all different things. We look at the early environment, uh, maternal behavior, stress early on in life versus uh, stress later in life, social interactions and how they play a role in that. In that um, social interactions in, in juveniles versus adult ones, uh, fear, memory, stress throughout this timeline. And the levels of analysis that we, that we ask those questions is actually across different modalities. We do a lot of gene expression and genomic analysis. We look at neural circuits and network level plasticity. Uh, we look at physiology, stress reactivity, HPA axis. Um, I've even gone to where I did not think I'll go before, and we have now some electrophysiology in the lab. Uh, and we do a lot of behavior, learning, and memory paradigms. When we talk about plasticity, it's usually plasticity within the, as you see, physiological roles, um, learning, memory, so on. There's another, uh, sort of almost a third or a half of the lab that does a different project that I won't touch upon at all today, which is pathological plasticity. What happens when plasticity goes awry? And this is uh, post-traumatic epilepsy. Epilepsy that develops post-traumatic brain injury, and the ways to block that, and this is something I won't touch today. So when we start talking about that, um, let me just introduce you to something I'm sure you're all aware of, but just get the gist of the details of it, which is adult hippocampal neurogenesis. So we all know that most of the brain uh, doesn't have much of a regenerative capacity. However, the hippocampus is one of two areas of the brain that has stem cells that generate new neurons throughout life. 
One area is the subventricular zone, and that creates um, neurons that then go through the rostral migratory stream and become olfactory neurons. And the other area where that happens is the hippocampus. Within the hippocampus, it's in the dentite gyrus, and there's a very thin layer, there's a granular layer, where stem cells arise. They proliferate throughout life and generate um, more neurons throughout life. It's not a lot of them, and we'll, we'll touch a little bit about that and what do they mean um, later on, but you can definitely see uh, a steady state of generation of neurons within that area, and it's very, very um, influenced by environmental factors. Those stem cells, um, if you start lo asking questions about their cellular identity, uh, you see that this is a not a homogeneous population. Though of course, they sort of progress through. You have uh, quiescent stem cells, you have the progenitors, and they um, are able to make new neurons, but also new glia. And this is a, an interesting and sort of an open question in the field is exactly how much of that happens. Mostly people look at the neurons that they make and in a regular situation they mostly make neurons. So about 90% uh, of those cells will become neurons. You could also take them out and grow them in a dish and we do that. And when you put them in a dish and you support them with the right uh, growth factors in the, in the case of the cells from the rat, this is uh, FGF2, Fibroblast growth factor two is that what they're dependent on. They're going to continue to proliferate in the dish and make uh, more and more cells. We can also then withdraw the FGF2 and let them differentiate, and they'll make uh, mostly neurons, but then some glia as well, all in the dish. And we follow them in both ways. It's actually a really cool movie, but it takes too long. They kind of go. Th this is days. This is over days. Um, when you put them in a dish, no, it's not months, but when you put them in a dish, they, they're quite active. So when you put them in a the dish, they'll take about three days before you'll need to divide them again. This starts from a really small population, so they take much longer. They have a critical mass. But when you start with the right cl critical mass, with about three days, they will populate a whole dish. Those newborn neurons... Um, look like a neuron, they sound like a neuron, they quack like a duck bird. So they have, they express all the mature neuronal markers, they display the morphology of the dentate granule neurons, the neurons that are around them. Um, they send the appropriate projections to the cells that are neighboring to them. They form correct synaptic connections with them. Um, and that's where the field stood for many, many years, saying they look like a neuron. Then someone came up and said, you really must say that they, you really must show that you can have activity so from them. And the Gage Lab showed several years ago that you can record from them. And they will look indistinguishable from the neurons around them. But then came another um, interesting p part of this story, which is it's not always the case. If you actually follow them within their lifetime, so as they mature, they have a very short window of time where they have enhanced synaptic plasticity. They're hyper excitable. And it turns out that this is a very important uh, feature, and we'll come back to that. Um, are they actually active? Yes, they are. There are now more and more tools to look at whether they're active or not. And you can see that they're selectively activated in learning tasks. And the field was kind of stuck for many years about what do they really mean, because there aren't that many of them. We don't find tons of them. So you have a little few more neurons. Do they really mean anything or not? But the fact that they're activating in learning tasks was the first step into that. They're heavily regulated, which also kind of tells you something about them being important physiologically or relevant. There are things that push them up towards making more neurons and things that push them down towards making less neurons. Uh, environmental enrichment and learning and um, anything that sort of use it and lose it kind of thing, you see more neurons. More than that, you see less of them being lost. So what do I mean about being lost? But they're bored, and about two weeks out, they become... Uh, your hyperplastic immature neuron, and four weeks out, they're a mature neuron that's indistinguishable from its neighbor. But at that point, you also only keep about 50% of them. The rest of the 50% are eliminated out, and that's very similar to what happens in development. However, if, they're, if the rats, the rodents, are exposed to an enriched environment, more of them are kept. More of them survive. Um, physical exercise, and specifically running, uh, free will running, so if you make them run, that doesn't occur. They have to choose it, uh, will enhance uh, this adult neurogenesis. 
um, antidepressants are very tightly regulating that, and actually the, the, the newer papers that show that the antidepressant action is dependent on adult neurogenesis, because if you look at depression models in animals where the adult neurogenesis is depleted, antidepressants don't work as well, or don't work at all. Um, there's a recent paper from Elizabeth Gould showing that sex uh, upregulates adult neurogenesis. I'm just giving you the full options of if you wanted more neurons. And um, epilepsy is one of the strongest forces that drives down adult neurogenesis. This is sort of a different story in my mind. Because we're studying epilepsy, I, can, I put it in, and, and this is something that we are aware of, but this is not exactly your physiological, but a pathological process. It seems that those are not making the right projections, the right connections. They're actually increasing excitability of the hippocampus, therefore actually um, maybe contributing to the epileptogenic process. Things that push it down are stress and the stress hormone glucocorticoids, uh, inflammation in the brain, aging. So if you just plot neurogenesis throughout the lifespan, it's very high and then it drops off um, as the animals get older. Ethanol, jet lag, recently shown. So within stress, of course, our, the, the, the focus of my lab was on stress and we started to ask the question of what exactly are the mechanisms and how does stress affect that. And within stress, um, this is a very, very simplistic way to think about stress. A lot of different things occur in stress. The cholinergic system is one of them that um, I should know of. But if you really, really simplify uh, what happens in stress in terms of the, of the circulation is that you get increased levels of cortisol through the adrenal glands. Interestingly, in aging, you have increased uh, levels of cortisol through it. So it, there's a connection there. When you remove the adrenal glands and you remove the ability uh, of the, the circulating levels, the increased circulating levels of glucocorticoids, you also remove stress effects on neurogenesis. So it's mediated through that. And that was the knowledge when we got into the field and started looking at it and started asking the question of, so we know now it's glucocorticoids, let's ask how does glucocorticoid, what do they do? They can do all different things, right? They can affect the stem cells themselves, this very quiescent pool, they can um, affect the progenitor's uh, pool, they can affect any one of those um, cells that come out of it, and the, the literature was kind of uh, very simplistic. Glucocorticoids, you get less neurons at the end, but nothing in the in-between. So we set out to look at the in-between. This is uh, work done by a very great graduate student in my lab that graduated um, recently, Sundari Chetty, and then carried on by the postdoc, Andrea Nicholas and Alana Wong. And I'll show you a little bit of what they found. There's, um, the gist of it is it does all of that, all of the above. It affects all different levels. It affects proliferation. Uh, it affects the choices of the fate. It affects the, the maturation and the differentiation and the survival of those cells. But I'll focus on some aspects of it that we think are more interesting. So here's something to think about is how do we track those cells? I told you there aren't that many of them. How do we ask questions about them? There's several ways. The easiest of them is to inject with something that will always mark proliferating cells, cells when they are um, dividing. And that's um, an analog of thymidine called BRDU or EDU or a any kind of, of an analog, basically, of timidine that you can come in later with an antibody and probe for it. And that will tell you the birth date of that cell. When I inject it in a specific time point, I can come back and say, I know that this cell, if it's positive for BRDU, was undergoing S phase at the time that I injected. Right? That makes sense. So this is one way that we do it, and we uh, combine that with looking at different cell fate markers. So we can combine it with a marker that will tell us whether it's a neuron, an immature neuron, a mature neuron, an algid endocyte, and so on. The other way to do it is as I said before, culture those cells. We can harvest them out of the hippocampus. It's not a trivial thing, but you could harvest them out of the hippocampus and culture them in a dish. We culture them as monolayers, and they're dependent at that point on the growth factor or the lack of them where we can play with, do we want to look at proliferation? Do we want to look at differentiation? And the first really surprising part to it was that there's an effect on the cell fate. So what did we do here? There, those are um, rats that got BRDU, so we know that we're looking at the cells that were proliferating here in those three days, and then we let them go through uh, immobilization paradigm 
for seven days. Immobilization is a, is a very mild stress paradigm. It's not uh, extremely traumatic, but when it goes on and on and on, it's really annoying for the animals. It's not a physical distress, but they can't move for three hours per day when they're in that uh, little bag. Where they so when you do this for seven days, you get a consistent elevation of cortisol levels. It doesn't drop down. Um, as opposed to other stress protocols, they don't really habituate to it. They get very annoyed, and they continue to be annoyed over time. We can do it now for 14 or 21 days, and they still get the same response. And then we look at the cells that are BRDU positive, hence were born here, and look at their cell fate. And the literature tells us they should have less neurons because that's chronic stress, and chronic stress drives down neurogenesis. And it does, when you look at the number of neurons, you get less neurons. The interesting and surprising part to it was that we got more oligodendrocytes. And that was something we completely did not uh, guess that will happen. It's, it's kind of known in the literature that they might make astrocytes. Oligodendrocytes were less known. But yet, we get more oligodendrocytes. Moreover, we get them in a different location. It's not extremely different, but if you think of the dentate gyrus, the cells are born in the subgranular zone, and they migrate up, the neurons migrate up, and become part of the granular layer whereas the oligodendrocytes actually migrate down and get stuck in the hilus where you see tracks, where, they would, where you would suppose that they should be. So we know that that happens with stress. Can we uh, mimic that with glucocorticoids? So now we don't do a stress protocol, but those rats actually got BRDU for three days the same way, and now for seven days instead of stress, we just inject glucocorticoids to them, and we inject a glucocorticoid level that is very similar to the amount that one would see in a chronic stress protocol. And we wait, uh, and we perfuse them at the end, like we did before, so seven days, or after 14 days, letting them uh, calm down, chill out for seven days. This is known in the literature to eliminate the stress effect. So if we're looking at the neurons, we should see a drop after seven days and a recovery after 14 days, and indeed that's the case. What happens with the oligodendrocytes, those new uh, surprising oligodendrocytes, we see an increase and a very pronounced increase in the number of, of newborn oligodendrocytes in the hilus after seven days, and it persists a week later. So those oligodendrocytes actually do not recover. They stay around. Where are they coming from? Why, why are we getting more oligodendrocytes? And there are several ways to ask this question. One of them would be to do in vivo lineage tracing. If we think that they're part they're coming from the neural precursor cells, from the stem cells that mostly make neurons, then if we were to lineage trace, let's say with transgenic animal, that cell, and then let it develop over, over time, we can ask whether we see oligodendrocytes that come from that lineage. That's one way to ask this question, that it requires transgenic animals. The other way to ask this question is in vitro. We use our in vitro system where we're taking out those neural precursor cells and growing them in vitro and say, what if we were to expose that more or less homogeneous population, but we know that they don't have oligodendrocytes progenitor cells to glucocorticoids and see if we get more oligodendrocytes. And I'll tell you about the, both those. We started with, uh, with, with the transgenic more recently, so we don't have concrete answers for that, but I can tell you that when we are lineage tracing in a line that have uh, ROSA YFP on a nestin positive cell, so every cell that's nestin positive, nestin is a marker for those neuroprecursor cells, um, and that is on a Cree-ER, so that's tamoxifen inducible. We can induce with tamoxifen, get those cells to be a lineage trace, and then follow them once the animals are treated with cord, and we see a trend that is where we wanted. Uh, we see a drop in the, in the GCL and the uh, granular cell layer, and we see an increase in the hyalur cells that are BRDU. We're now doing the analysis of the actual cell state of those. The other thing that we did is looking in vitro. So let's take those cells out of the brain and ask whether in a dish they're going to be responsive to glucocorticoids, and they are. Uh, we see, so when those cells sit in a dish, and this now also tells me that this is a cell autonomous action because they do that without any other cells around. It's only the stem cells. We see a drop in the neurons and an increase in the oligodendrocyte site. And this is actually um, extremely exciting because it's extremely very, very hard to impossible to even get oligodendrocyte in the dish from those cells. It's, it, they don't make that on a regular level. So court actually pushes them to make more oligodendrocytes. 
That was exciting. We started asking why. How does it do that, right? So how does a cell become oligodendrocyte? If you go into all the oligodendrocyte literature, there are um, a bunch of transcription factors that are known to determine that the cell will become oligodendrocyte. And those are uh, genes that are transcription factors. They're called oligo one and oligo two. They're part of a more complex transcriptional fa uh, network where they're actually inhibited by those two proteins called inhibitory of differentiation 2 and 4, ID2 and 4. This ID2 and 4 are proteins that bind those oligs and keep them in the cytoplasm. And as they do that, less of them are in the nucleus, hence less of them are active. They can't really push the cells to become oligodendrocyte. The ITs themselves are being regulated by those two proteins, BMP2 and 4, and that's antagonized by the very well-known noggin. So knowing that, we set out to look at those cells, and we looked at their transcription factor. And the very, very obvious place looking under the lamp is they make less neurons. Let's, lo let's look at the transcriptional factors that makes a cell become a neuron, and none of those are changed. We looked at a battery of them, and they're all exactly the same. The, the cell still has the transcriptional program that tells them they need to become a neuron. So that's not it. They know to become a neuron. However, when you start looking at that transcriptional network that I just showed you, you see that there's a very big increase in oligo one and oligo two. There's a decrease in ID2, and there's a decrease in BMP2. And you can antagonize all of that using noggin. So this whole transcriptional network that I just described is intimately linked to the response with court. If that's true, if all of that is actually happening, we, this is on the, I forgot to say, this is all on the RNA level. This is real-time PCR analysis. If that's all true, then when we look at the protein, we should see less oligo one protein and specifically less oligo one in the nucleus rather than in the cytoplasm because we have more of what keeping it, less of what's keeping it out. And that's indeed the case. When we look at uh, nuclear localization of the protein oligo one, we see much more of it in stress in the animals. We see much more of it with animals that are treated with cord, and we see much more of it um, in the nucleus in cells that are treated with cord. So all of that that I'm telling you tells you that you get this transcriptional orchestrated transcriptional programming that's very complex that just takes a cell that's about to become a neuron and have the whole machinery to become a neuron and pushes it where it's not supposed to go and makes it choose to become an oligodendrocyte and it's now getting to become an oligodendrocyte. Um, I wasn't showing you the data for that, but we actually see a progression where we first see immature oligodendrocytes and then we see mature oligodendrocytes and, um, and they're accumulating in the right place where you would uh, suppose oligodendrocytes would be, which is where the neuronal tracts are. So what does that mean? This is where I kind of stopped and said, that, that's really cool on the molecular level um, and fate changes are sort of a hot topic in, in stem cells, so that's fantastic, but what does it mean to have a little more oligodendrocytes in a mature brain? And I'm not sure, I wish I had an answer for you, but I can tell you how we're, we're trying to solve that riddle. Um, we're trying to do that by genetically modifying the levels of oligodendrogenesis in the brain with all different ways. So one way is to antagonize with the dominant negative oligo 2 vector. We block the oligo 2, we block the production of oligodendrocytes. Um, another option is to block the glucocorticoid receptor. If the glucocorticoid receptor is involved in that, if I block that signaling cascade, I might block the generation of oligs. And then I could also have viral vectors that I put in and just express those oligo 1 and oligo 2 and push the cells to become more oligodendrocytes. I'll show you just, a just one example of that, but I'll tell you that we now get all four of those vectors working and doing what we want them to do, which is more or less oligodendrocytes. We're at the stage that we're running those animals on behavioral testing and asking, what does it mean when you have a little more oligodendrocytes in the brain? The jury's still out on that. Um, the way that we, uh, the, the one that I chose to show you is the dominant negative glucocorticoid receptor. Uh, this is a a viral vector that I engineered actually when I was still at Stanford, uh, which uh, antagonizes the binding of the glucocorticoid receptor to the GRE promoter. So the element in the promoter that one needs to get a response from glucocorticoid is a glucocorticoid responsive element, 
the spiral vector is engineered based on a very interesting variant of that that you don't usually see. In rodents, it doesn't exist at all. It, in humans, you won't see it if you just look at a normal human being. However, when you take asthma patients that got steroids for years and years and years, there's a subpopulation that become uh, completely irresponsive to the court treatment. And it was unknown why. And one of, the, one of the thoughts around it was maybe they are just less sensitive. We should give them more and more and more. But that just worsens the case for them. And when someone had the idea to take out their lung cells, grow them, and look at the molecular profiling of them, found out that they start, um, they have a, a, a shift in a sort of splicing. And a splice variant that comes up is this GR beta that is just antagonizing any part. So every time you're going to give them court, you're going to make more and more and more cells do that. They don't respond to that, and they respond worse to So I engineered something like that in a rat, adapting it to the rat gene, and it works really great. And when you put it into stem cells in vitro, um, you can completely block the court response so that they don't make more oligodendrocytes anymore, and you restore their ability to make neurons. When you put them into neurons in, in vivo, when we inject them, stereotactically inject them into the hippocampus of animals, uh, we block the ability to make more oligodendrocytes. Interestingly enough, you do not restore their ability to make more neurons. So that's an interesting fact. I'm not sure why it does that. It definitely has sort of a flavor to which genes it blocks and not when one runs an array or RNA-sec on it. Um, I can't tell you why this doesn't restore it, but for our purposes, it's fantastic because that means I'm not changing anything but the amount of oligodendrocytes in those cells. So it happens to be a really good tool. So that would be one way that we're going to look at what does that mean. Another um, way is that we've just fi uh, recently finished creating uh, mutants that have inducible GR knockout in NPCs. So those are mice where the GR, the glucocorticoid receptor, is knocked out specifically only out of their nesting cells. And now that we've got those mice, this was done in collaboration with Francois Tranche in Paris. Um, the, the graduate student uh, that worked on it got to go to Paris for a year and a half and create those mice. She got a lot of support from the lab around her. Everyone is <laughs> really jealous. And now people are looking for other projects where they, they get to go for a year and a half somewhere else. She created those mice. We now know that they exist. They do not respond, only their stem cells do not respond to stress. So it's a very specific, fine-tuned way to ask what do those cells do in terms of the stress response. And what she recently did is ran a whole battery of behavioral tests on them, as well as um, HPA axis regulation tests on them. And we're trying to ask what do, this, what do those cells specifically do in the, st in the stress response. And it's... Um, as you can imagine, it's kind of looking, it, it, it's a small population of cells. It's the response only to stress, so this is going to be a very fine-tuned response um, where uh, we have initial preliminary data to say that we think we found where, they're, where they really play a role, and that seems to be fear discrimination, but that would be hopefully next year's seminar. So that's one way to ask those questions. Another, question, another way to think about it is all good endocytes. Clearly, they are the myelinating cells of the brain. So does that mean that more oligodendrocytes would mean more myelin? And not necessarily more oligodendrocytes mean more myelin. People that work on MS know that there's a lot of ways in which people increase the amount of oligodendrocytes that do not translate into more myelin and therefore don't really fix MS. Interestingly enough, MS patients get glucocorticoids uh, as part of their treatment. Not for that reason, obviously, but for the uh, for the inflammatory effects. So, does it mean that we have more myelin? Does it mean that we get aberrant myelination, aberrant white matter patterning? I don't know. Uh, looking into the literature, what would white matter mean? Uh, sent us into a lot of interesting data from human populations, where if you look at any kind of mental disease that one you know pick pick your favorite, and you'll see that there are changes in white matter. Um, psychopathologies, depression, schizophrenia, PTSD, that's interesting to us, and so on. When you look at the literature, it's not clear that it's more. It's hypo, hyper, or a mixed picture of hypo and hyper in different areas of the brain. 
but it looks like there are differences in white matter in most of the mental illness. Um, the other thing that you could uh, very clearly know that early life stress has been associated with life lifelong vulnerability to mental illness. And that kind of made me think, a little more myelin in an adult brain, I don't know, might do something, might not, I think it's going to be a subtle thing. However, you can imagine that if stress comes early in life, at the peak of myelination, that will really change the patterning of white matter in a way that can set a brain on a different trajectory to be less or more vulnerable to mental illness, to later stresses in life, to second hits, and so on. And that was exactly our hypothesis that we went around asking. This is done by uh, uh, very fantastic three postdocs in the lab, Karishma, Nupur, and Sue, that are looking at developmental increases in oligodendrogenesis and how they're affecting. And we do that by um, different ways in which we look at the early environment. Uh, some of us are looking at maternal separation. The rats are separated from their moms on days 2 to 14 on, of their life. They're separated every day for three hours. This, was, this is a very well accepted early life stress protocol. It's known to not affect things like the rate of weight gain and so on, um, but it does affect um, other things like HPA axis. Uh, we have, of course, a control that is not being handled. There's another protocol that we look at, which is maternal behavior. I'll come back to that in a minute and explain a little more about that because it's a little more complicated. And we look at adolescent stress, another sort of critical period that might be interesting. And then we ask whether the animals are less or more affected by stress early or, uh, later in their life. And we also ask whether we can intervene in that. And we intervene either by uh, genetic strategies when we give one of our vectors and try to revert that, or we intervene with uh, enrichment or physical activity that is known to affect exactly the same level that we're asking and see do the, does that change. We're looking at the molecular and cellular markers, uh, the, the myelin content, um, and then probing anxiety, stress reactivity, depression, um, and learning and memory paradigms. I won't show you all of that because I, I, wanted, to I wanted to shove a lot of stuff into the seminar, so I just chose one uh, paradigm to focus on here, which is the maternal behavior, because it's a really interesting paradigm. It's a naturally occurring um, phenomena. Basically, we're not doing anything to the animals. We're not manipulating them in any way except for looking at them. And if you take a population of, of mothers, or rat mothers, or mice for that matter, and you get a really excited pool of undergrads that are willing to sit in the animal facility for hours and hours and do the boring task of recording the maternal interactions. They literally sit there and write how much time the, the mothers are playing with them, are nursing them in an archback nursing, which is not the one that's associated to, uh, to the feeding, licking and grooming them. This will fall on, on a sort of a bell curve where most of them will be somewhere in the middle, but you do have the, the very helicopter hands-on mom versus the more neglecting moms. And if you go to the groups that are two standard deviation away from the mean, you'll get your very uh, l low lichen and grooming r moms and your very high lichen and grooming moms. As you can imagine, this is extremely um, difficult experiment to do in terms of how many mice it takes because you start with a big room or three rooms and you end up with two tiny little groups. But when you follow those groups, when you follow the offspring here, it's extremely clear that their trajectories are very, very different. They're very different in the way that the HPA axis is, uh, is developing. They're very different in the way that GR is expressed in their hippocampus. They're different in their cognitive abilities and in their stress reactivity. And the ones that come, the offspring that comes from the low lichen and grooming moms, and this was shown to be an epigenetic phenomena, so this depends on epigenetic programming, of the promoter of the glucocorticoid receptor gene um, will be will have high uh, corticosterone level, high anxiety, low uh, lichen and grooming themselves. So this also uh, sort of dictates their own behavior, and you can um, cross foster them and show that it goes with that. And they have low cognitive abilities. The high lichen and grooming ones are those uh, wonder kids. They're they're low levels of corticosterone. They're not as hysterical. They don't 
react and they do really well on cognitive tasks. It's not as simple as one would think. I mean, we, we definitely tend to just bring our own biases to that and the balance and say, you know, the good moms, the bad moms. I would just tell you that in other works that we do in the lab, and this is done a lot in collaboration with Darlene Francis that established that model, it's not as clean as that. When you put them in stressful situations, those one guys will do better. So it turns out that there is a evolutionary, an evolutionary logic to that so that if you're going to be in a stressful environment, you might as well be one of those guys. Maybe you're not the smartest pencil in the box, but um, the sharpest uh, tool in the shed, right? But you will survive better. They mature uh, quicker. Their sexual maturity comes quicker, so they will be the survivors when, when the going gets tough. So what happens in terms of their uh, hippocampal stem cells? When we look at their hippocampal cell cells, it's a very, very dramatic difference. There's an, uh, a real dramatic difference in the amount of proliferation in their granule cell levels. Uh, early on, so we, we look at them now at day uh, 22, right at winning, at puberty, and as adults. And the, the differences are there all throughout since uh, in the level of proliferation. And the high ones are the ones that have much more proliferation, as one would assume. Do they have more oligodendrocytes? They do. So the, and they do only later in life. So you don't see it right at the very beginning. At P22 and at P34, you don't see, oh, that looks soft, right? Okay, so that's all right. Um, it looks awful. Right, you got to trust me on it. Um, but that you start seeing those at P90 and on. And they have more oligodendrocytes, and this happens to be a mature oligodendrocyte marker. But more interestingly, they have much more myelin in the right places. So when you affect, when the stress comes at the peak of myelination, you can really switch and kind of shift them in a way that changes their brains, I think, much more dramatically. And you can think about it maybe in a way of then having a white matter patterning that's a little bit aberrant, and those animals might be more susceptible to stress later on in life, might be the population that mental illness is more likely to develop in. Right, so what did I show you up until now? Uh, that stress orchestrates this multigenic response that promotes more oligodendrocytes, that low levels of maternal care correlate with more oligodendrocytes and more myelin. I'll tell you, but I didn't show you that maternal stress early in life seem to do exactly the same thing, push them towards more oligodendrocytes, more myelin. And together, that kind of indicates that early life experience and adult stress are both uh, have enduring effects on oligodendrocytes and myelin and myelination capacity in the hippocampus. But as I alluded to before, something that bothers me and other people in the field is what is the functional relevance of those cells, right? So let's go back to those cells this population that makes new neurons and new oligodendrocytes, very few of them, what do they really mean? And the field approached this by trying to just sort of overall knock out this population, which as you can imagine is a little bit of a brute force uh, way to ask this. I think our, our transgenic is going to be a more fine way to ask this. But what happens when you brute force just eliminate that? You can irradiate it and you, as you would uh, any other proliferating cells in the body, those cells would not proliferate, would, would be knocked out when you irradiate. Uh, you could pharmacologically give a chemotherapeutic agent to knock them out. You can genetically knock them out uh, with nesting promoter driving a TK and then giving them um, the, right, the right signal for TK to act. And when that, is, when that happens, when you ablate that kind, uh, you see that certain types of hippocampal dependent memory is ablated. So not everything, but certain types. It actually turns out that more taxing uh, tasks is what's going to be really important for that. So let me give you an example. If you'd had a 12-arm maze and you'd ask a rat to learn to find a treat at that end of the room versus that end of the room, that's really pretty easy. They look very different from one another and they do it very well with or without those cells. However, if you were now asking the rat to learn uh, discrimination between th this arm and an arm that's 12 degrees away from that, this is much more, ta much more taxing. You really need to do the fine details of the room, and this is where they fail unless they have that population intact. 
it also turns out that there's times to that. The cells are really important at that immature stage, two to three weeks old, when they're hyperexcitable, or two to four weeks old, depending on who you ask and depending on whether it's rats or mice. Um, but this immature stage is where they actually participate in, performing, in forming those robust uh, spatial memories and extinction tasks. And it was very, very obvious that mostly it's spatial information that those cells are holding, but that is not a big surprise, given that they're in the hippocampus. That might be me. So, so our question within that, So our question within that was, um, are they involved in emotional memory? This is done by uh, Liz Kirby, who's a graduate student in the lab, uh, Aaron Friedman, who's a graduate student, David, who's a graduate student, and Wayne, who's an undergrad in the lab. And the question there was, what about emotional memory? Right? Are they important for that? We know spatial memory. Let's ask emotional memory that has to do with spatial information. And I'll give away the answer and tell you, yes, it is. Uh, by the way, this is the only part in the talk that's, that's published data. The rest of it is um, sort of unpublished data and, and work that's ongoing in the lab, so I wanted to keep it more updated and interesting. So the giveaway answer, yes, it is. How did we look at that? We started by ablating the amygdala and asking, does the amygdala have any bearing into the hippocampus? And I told you about only environmental factors that influence the, the level of neurogenesis and proliferation in the hippocampus, but interestingly, I don't know, no one looked at any other brain area. Nobody looked at connections, and that didn't make a lot of sense to me because when you think about the brain, it's all about connections. Mo other brain area must be talking um, to this population. We know that other brain areas are talking to the hippocampus. Why not this cells? And the basolateral uh, nucleus of the amygdala is known to send information to that part of the brain it's known to send emotional content type of information. So let's look at what happens when we ablate that. So we come in um, stereotactically, we inject an uh, excitotoxic um, compound, and we literally ablate that part of the, of the amygdala, the basolateral nucleus. And when we look at the cells, we see a decrease in the amount of proliferating cells. Those are just two different markers to look at proliferation. We see a decrease in the proliferation of cells. Um, we don't see a decrease that has to do with differentiation. So we don't see a difference in the differentiation profile of the cells as opposed to what I told you before. With the stress, all of the populations are less. There's hardly any cells like this anyway, you see, so it doesn't matter, but all of them are just dropping down the same way. You got less glia, you got less neurons. Is that dependent on some kind of a circulating factor? We ablated both amygdalas. We might actually change glucocorticoid corticoid levels, for instance, or so on. So we ablated now one side, a unilateral lesion of the amygdala, and look at the two sides. And we find out that this is only uh, seen in the ipsilateral side and not in the contralateral side. So that is dependent not on a circulating factor, but on actual uh, neural connections between the amygdala and the hippocampus. I'll tell you in a, in a side story that there is no uh, monosynaptic connection between the amygdala and the hippocampus. It's a, uh, it has to be at least a bisynaptic, and it's through different brain areas. It can be through enterorhinal cortex or others. Um, we see a drop. What happens if we ablate another part of the amygdala, a nucleus that is right next to the central nucleus, and that doesn't occur? So it's ipsilateral, and it's area-specific. Is it dependent on the cell loss in the amygdala? No, it's not. We're injecting with a viral vector that overexpresses a potassium channel that quiets down the amygdala and when we do that, we get exactly the same thing. So no input, no neural input from the amygdala is the same thing as, as killing the amygdala in that sense. So the next question was, again, what does it mean? And we turned to do a paradigm that's called contextual fear conditioning to ask this question. In this paradigm, the animals are put in a box, they get a foot shock, and then the next day they're put into exactly the same box but with no foot shock, or the same box that looks a little bit different now because we masquerade it. And when you do that, they, they freeze here. They remember the context. They don't in the novel context. It's a very well-known paradigm. We 
put that together with injecting BRDU so we can ask about the activation of the cells that are newborn in those two contexts. We inject the BRDU two weeks before that so that they're going to be in the right age to be hyper-excitable. And at the ex re-exposure to the fear or no-fold environment, we look at the expression of CFOS as a marker for the activity of those cells. And when we do that, we see that those cells are highly activated. They're very important um, in the fear memory. At the same time that we did that, another paper came out showing that if you ablate them, and now it's, again, this problem of you ablating every single cell in the, of the proliferating pool in that sense, they lose the ability to remember the novel. So we're showing that they're activated, and another group is showing that they're important for that. Is it amygdala mediated? We did exactly the same thing, but this time starting with a unilateral lesion of the amygdala. You have to do it unilaterally because if it's bilaterally, they're not going to be afraid, then they're not going to learn anything or remember anything. But when you do it unilaterally, you can ask about the proliferation in that ipsilateral side, and it is amygdala dependent. So when the amygdala is not online, in that side, you do not get the enhanced activation of those cells in a fear memory. This is just a summary of all of that. So it's all fantastic, but I came from a lab, as Mona said, the, the, the lab that I went to to do my postdoc was Robert Topolsky, and Robert has one big thing that he's pushing all his life, and it's a really interesting idea of acute stress being really, really different than chronic stress. And acute stress is not always bad. The thing is, stress is not necessarily bad for you. It's what stress and how long and so on. And when it's acute stress and when it's shorter, with the right amount, it's actually going to be arousing rather than, um, rather than depressing. So, so let's look at what happens with those cells. So chronic stress literature is very, very well known. There's definitely an effect that we know that suppresses those cells. But when you look at the acute one, it's all over the place. There are uh, initial papers showing that there's an, a decrease, exactly the same way as chronic stress. There are later papers that are saying there's no difference. There's one paper that says there's an increase in the growth factors that would actually in, indicate that maybe there's increased proliferation, but not showing increased proliferation. So it's pretty much all over the place, and I thought this is a good place to stick our teeth in and start to look at what's really going on there. And I will tell you the part of the answer was looking at the hippocampus in greater detail, meaning dorsal hippocampus is not ventral hippocampus. And this is something that starts, I don't know, three years ago or so started being a big thing. Uh, there are differences in the ventral versus the dorsal. And indeed there are. And in this project we've definitely shown that there is. So what do we do here? There's an acute stress stressor. Um, there's a story here that's interesting, and I'm, we might talk about it later if you are interested in that, about how the handling changes all of that. And so if the, because it's such an acute stressor, there's three hours of stress, it's really important that the animals are completely habituated beforehand and not have any other stress response. So we're profusely handling them before, and then they're exposed to either three hours of immobilization, 30 minutes of a novel environment, uh, 30 minutes of an sh unpredictable shock, or, or through our cord injections, and they're sacked 30 minutes after that, three hours after that. So we're all talking about sort of a three-hour paradigm of stress increases, and there's, a, um, there's an amount of stress that goes with immobilization that doesn't go with the other one. So when we look at them, we measure the cord levels that go with the immobilization, they're the highest, and they correlate to about 40 milligrams per kilogram of corticosterone, whereas the uh, novel or shock environment, kinda, uh, get, we get to around five milligrams of cord. And what we see is, while novel and shock do sort of nothing to the amount of proliferation in the dorsal hippocampus, immobilization really pushes it up. You get higher proliferation three hours very, very quickly after exposure to stress, and you can mimic that with giving them the same amount of global corticoids, 40 but you can't mimic that with intermediate amount of stress. So some kind of a level of stress that would sort of get a peak in proliferation. We know that too much of that, when we give it for seven days, we see a decrease. We know that little doesn't do it, but, it, but the middle amount does it, and that kind of starts to remind you of this inverted U-shaped curve that you see a lot of times with glucocorticoids. So 
the next obvious question was, is it dependent on amygdala? We've already shown the whole amygdala story um, has to do with it. The stress, stress must be with amygdala. Let's shut down the amygdala during those three hours and see what happens. And it is not. It is not dependent on amygdala. It doesn't change anything. You get exactly the same increase with and without an amygdala online. That was surprising. We gathered ourselves and continued on and said, let's think about other things that change. And those would be growth factors. We already know that growth factors are changing with acute stress. We know that growth factors might influence proliferation in such a timeline. Let's look at the growth factors that has to do with that. And when you go to the literature and, and pick up all the different growth factors that are changing, those would be FGF2 and IGF and um, VEGF and BDNF and I don't know. I, I took out this. Uh, I took out the slide that shows you many, 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 many graphs, and nothing was changing except FGF2. Turns out that FGF2, mRNA, and protein is changing, and it's changing only in the dorsal hippocampus. And it's changing under the paradigms that push more proliferation, but not the other ones. So we get to see more of that. What's the source of this FGF2 protein? If you go to the literature again, astrocytes are supposed to secreted. So as I told you, another, another time that we were uh, sworn towards glia, not really meaning to. So we cultured astrocytes. We take astrocytes of the brain. We culture them. Uh, we actually do that a lot in the epilepsy project for other stuff. We throw glucocorticoid on them, and we see an increase in the amount of FGF2 protein that's secreted into the media. Well, that's lovely. Might that be it? But let's, let's do again the same trick. We can have those cells and throw glucocorticoid on them and nothing happens. You do not see this increase in proliferation as opposed to putting a lot of cord on them for a long time where we see the decrease in neurogenesis, the increase in oligodendrogenesis. Within three hours, nothing happens when you put cord on those cells. So not cell autonomous. What happens when I take astrocyte conditioned media and put it on the cells? I get this increase. And... When we treat this astrocyte conditioned media with a neutralizing antibody against FGF2, so the only thing that we are absorbing out of it is FGF2, we don't see this increase anymore. It's blocked by it. So this proliferation enhancement is dependent on FGF2 secreted from astrocytes. Same story, let's look at what that might mean in, uh, in a contextual fear extension paradigm this time. So it's very, very similar. The rats are habituated to the to the box, then they get a foot shock in it. Then they are in the box again, and they're not shocked. And they learn to extinct that. They should learn that this is not a threatening environment anymore. And then a day later, you can test them. And this is sort of a, a the short version of that. And when you test them, you learn how much they learn that this should not be um, an environment that, that threatens them. And you can do all of that while exposing them to the acute stress beforehand. And then ask that question. Now, when you look at the NPCs, they're going to be sort of proliferating, differentiating, maturating. At around two weeks, we have newborn neurons. And if we're predicting that stress creates more newborn neurons, more proliferation, hence more newborn neurons, they should be active right here. They shouldn't be active here, because this is not yet, they're not yet there to really affect anything. So if we're right, we should see an effect on their memory here in the later time point, but not in the earlier time point. And that's exactly what happens. The training goes exactly the same to the two of them, and the extinction, they look the same. They don't extinct better or less than the other ones. But when you test them with the probe, we see that the, the rats that were stressed a day before that, a day before the start of the paradigm, don't show any difference from the rats that were not stressed. However, the rats that were stressed two weeks before that are much better at learning the extinction. They're just doing better under this stressful, uh, fearful conditioning paradigm. What happens to the newborn neurons? So we take out the brains, and again, we look at the CFOS expression in those BRDU cells that were tracked two weeks before that, and you see that um, a, there's a very big difference in the amount of activation of those cells because the cells that are double positive for CFOS um, double cortin and BRDU are much higher. So those cells are activated very specifically, the cells that are there because they were preconditioning stress. So we're very excited about that because it sort of shows us it's the first uh, molecular mechanisms to come with this idea uh, 
of stress can be enhancing or stress can be a good thing, when at the same time you actually um, demonstrate that moderate acute stress can stimulate heightened plasticity in, in some cases and memory function via increased neurogenesis. What's the take home message from all of that? Um, so apart from the details, go you know, take a step back from the details and what's, what's important to remember in that. I think one of the things is the role of glia in all of that. Oligodendrocytes play a role in things that we didn't think they do before. Astrocytes play a role in things we didn't think before, and so on. Um, the fact that those cells, this particular cell population that's not very huge, actually have a very big uh, role in emotional memory, maybe in post-traumatic stress disorder and mental disease. This is a, a, a new population to think about. And lastly, I think it's important to think about how early life environment actually can put the brain on a trajectory to a very different development and therefore very different function throughout life uh, to be even the, the difference between physiologically, cognitively high functioning brain and, and a disordered or uh, prone to disorders brain. And the early life environment could be things like trauma early in life, but could be as small as the maternal interactions. Um, just to give thanks to the people that actually did the work, um, the, the postdocs and graduate students that did the specific things that I, uh, that I did, I showed throughout. Um, collaborators that worked with us on this specific project are Robert Sapolsky at Stanford, Darlene Francis, uh, and Francois Tranche. Getting someone in David Pleasure and UC Davis. Um, and the very generous funding that we have from different sources that helps us do all of those fun things. And then lastly, uh, the actual take home messages. Actual take home messages don't get stressed and do a lot of physical activity, you know. Not everyone at once. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I'm, uh, the the high lichen and grooming, low lichen and grooming was shown to be an epigenetic um, programming on the GR gene. Um, they're now looking at that model. The, the lab that does that is Mini Lab, Michael Mini and Moshe Ziff and. Montreal are now looking at more global chromatin changes, uh, but not specifically in those stem cells. We have a grant in with, um, with a group of Liz Blackburn at UCSF to look at those cells. Um, I don't know. We'll see. Um, it, she seems to think that there's definitely epigenetic and, and dynamic changes throughout life. Um, not. I don't know. I'm skeptical until I'll see it. The changes that they're showing is only in the very, very beginning. So actually the first two weeks of life and nothing outside of that changes anything in terms of the, of the chromatin changes that they're showing. Because it's a stem cell population, maybe, maybe it's a little more. But yeah. How old are these uh, How old are they when you start the experiment? So it depends. It's all different ages. Some of them are pre, you know, like neonates. Like, yeah. The the cells themselves you can only find them in the hippocampus yeah. or there's the question. Are they found only in the hippocampus or the stem cells? Look for, yes, People looked all over the brain. Yeah. People looked all over the brain and really, really hope to find them in other places. You do have some papers here and there that show them in other brain areas, but they're very not consistent. Consistently, you can find them two places in the brain, in the subventricular zone, and then they migrate all over and become olfactory neurons. They're not really regulated in the same way. They're pretty resistant to whatever you do to the animal. You got those cells, they're making them at the same amount, and they continue to make them at the same amount, whatever you do. They're, there's a second population, so then obviously 
something's different about this population than the F SVZ population. Um, in the hippocampus, and this is the population that I looked at, you, s you get much more of them in the newborn. So when I do those manipulations on the newborn new mice, then the population is really big. When I do them in adult animals, I see less of that. And the more out we go, the less we see us and other people. If you go to a mouse that's maybe 10, 12 months old, it's very hard to find those cells. <coughs> There's one paper that shows them in the amygdala, nobody else. In the BLA, there's one paper that shows that there is um, proliferation markers. Nobody else found it. The other problem is there are other cells that are proliferating in the cell, in the brain, right? So you can imagine you know, glia cells that are proliferating. You can imagine seeing um, immune cells that might get in and microglia that... So it's not clear. Only one paper shows very low amount. Nobody else found it in the amygdala. Yeah. The obvious question will be asked later. So, so what is so special about this? Uh, it is an open... I completely... Like yeah, I completely agree. What's so special about the structure? Uh, what's so special about those cells? Why are they even important if they're there or not? It's very clear that the niche supports them in a different way. So the niche that surrounds them seems to be different. If you take those cells, if you were to take out, and people did that, take out those neuroprecursor cells and put them somewhere else in the brain, they don't proliferate. If you take um, glial cells from the hippocampus and you culture them together, they work fantastically, and you can change them. If you take glial cells from the cortex, they don't. So it's something about the niche and the glia that's around them that seems to be different. Yeah. So the problem is, is that you can't really w look at, at that in humans. You can't really... And the behavior... I, I, the be yeah. So people that get chemotherapy that gets into the brain, but they don't have a... Yeah, I don't think anyone looked at that. There is one work done on cancer patients that, as part of their treatment, got BRDU, and then they did a post-mortem on them. If you know it started? It actually started in the 60s. There's a paper by... Altman and Duss that was done in 1967 or 5. It's a science paper that says they're proliferating cells in the brain and then no, nobody picked it up and nobody believed them for years and years and years and years. And then the paper with the patients is sometime in the 90s when there was a, there's sort of a someone picked it up later on and started to talk about it. The real boom became because of birds. Some um, Looking at birds, looking at bird brain, you get a lot of proliferation. And the proliferation there is really interesting because it's seasonal and it has to do with song learning. And every time they have to learn a new song, you get this boom in proliferation and then those cells are actually completely eliminated and you kind of recreate the whole area and the, the wiring in the area. And so Fernando Notabom did a lot of that work, fantastic work. Um, and this really spurred, I think, people to look at it. Uh, and then it was uh, it was interesting years to kind of do that. I mean, I was, it came into this world sort of as it was starting, and you had the kind of the kind of debate around it really changed. And it started with it doesn't really exist, or it exists all over the brain and doesn't mean anything, and it's only there. And what does it mean? And humans don't have it, and primates don't have it, and it matured. It's more than that now. We know that primates for sure have it. Uh, no human primates for sure have it. And humans, there's several works now. One with them the one with the chemotherapy, and then there's one in Sweden where they found a specific isotope that only could have get in when there's... And so there's hints that it's in humans as well. There are a lot of labs that are trying to do imaging in a way, non-invasive imaging, so that they can look at those cells. And again, there was this big hope some years ago when somebody said that they found uh, an MRS, uh, MRS microscopy protocol that can look at those cells and it was it was increased when they were running and it was decreased with age and it decreased with stress and it just followed everything to the T that it was supposed to be and nobody else ever managed to recapitulate any of that. But it'll come at some point, right?